Hi, I'm Ben. And I'm Josh. And this is the Bad at Magic podcast, a podcast about games, life, and other things. And welcome to episode 10. Oh, episode 10. Ben, we made it to double digits. I know. And every two weeks. So that's like, that's a long time. That's like a third of a year. Wow. Every two weeks and 10 episodes. I, you'd have to have some kind of crazy math genius to figure that out. Yeah. So today is the 29th of December. Uh, you and I last talked and we were just running up to Christmas and you were we were talking about lots of stuff related to Christmas. So did you have a happy Christmas? I had a very busy Christmas is what I had. How, did, how about yours? Yeah. So as a uh, I think I mentioned on the podcast we were gonna. Uh, I was gonna take two weeks of leave and drive from Illinois out to Utah, which is a super long drive. But man, has it been worth it? It's been great. Uh, that's uh, that drive does sound terrible, but I'm glad that you're enjoying Utah. You're still there now, right? Yeah, I'm in the, my parents' closet <laughs> looking for a quiet place. <laughs> so I forgot my good microphone, and I think you got a nice new microphone for Christmas. So maybe our audio quality will switch for this episode. That's wonderful. It's like the constant running gag is that your audio is always so crisp and clear and then my audio is always such garbage. So yes, hopefully this will be the one time that we can switch roles. We might need to add some sound deadening in that room. There is a little bit of an echo. And Which here room? I am, the, the, your guest room. Maybe you need to make the bed. Oh, oh, you're going to... Yeah, well, you know how it is. We had people stay here like three <laughs> or four weeks ago and we've been super busy. Um, I, well, I got my mom's us, sweaters that are color sorted here for uh, sound deadening. I was just going to say, not all of us can record in a nice, fully packed, tight closet for all the, the sound dampening. Yeah. So when you, when we last talked, you were talk, you were in the process of doing some woodworking project that you couldn't spoil because it was before Christmas. So now that Christmas has come, I want to know what it was. Well, but this, I don't know if I should still spoil it, because this is still the Christmas gift that I was going to send you in June. Ah, oh, no. It, what do I got to ask your sister what it was? <laughs> All right, so I'll go ahead and spoil it. Um, what I ended up making was, in large batches, uh, I made coasters for all the different family members. So everybody got a set of four handmade coasters uh, made with various types of different wood put together in different and interesting ways. Ah. And the things that made them unique is I installed bottle openers on the bottom of all of the coasters. Nice. So you like, you can never have enough bottle openers. In my house, I have them just, they're just everywhere. And they're always useful. It's always practical to have one within arm's reach. And so this is just one easy way to have, make a practical gift where you have a drink, you need to open it, the coaster opens it, and then it set, they set the drink on top of it. You say between sips of Blue Moon. Uh, I don't know if I like having the webcam on now that you get to watch me. <laughs> um, how did assembling the bicycle go? Yes, I did have to assemble my son's bike. That you were meant... worried that you weren't going to be able to do it. Oh, I, was, I wasn't worried that I wasn't going to be able to do it. I was worried that it was just going to take a long time. I was going to be up until all hours of the night. But no, it went really well. I mean, it's just a bicycle. Nothing incredibly complicated about it. Uh, I did it, this one bicycle doesn't have so when I put together my daughter's bike it was like made to have uh, training wheels on it so the back tire the back axle I guess bolts were really really long and so it was super easy to just install the the training wheels right on top of them okay this this bike wasn't made to have training wheels on it I had to get third party training wheels and so uh, the f the fit was a little little tight but there, like there's there's barely reached the first thread. Well, not quite that tight, but it was it was enough that where I can I'm confident and I'm comfortable that there's enough thread on there left after having everything together that it's not going to come flying off while he's riding somewhere. Yeah, which would be terrible and hilarious. You're making me want to change the uh, um, bad English word of the day because I remember that they don't use the word training wheels in the UK. No, they use the word stabilizers. Yeah, good. Well done, you. Uh, I, I only know that from the movie Arthur Christmas, which is oh. probably my new favorite Christmas movie, if you've ever seen it. Uh, no, but I'm going to take your recommendation on that one. Yes, it's, it's still close to holiday season. Go watch Arthur Christmas and watch it with your kids. It's hysterical. That does sound good. I, I do enjoy me some Arthur. That's one of those kids' cartoons like Peppa Pig that's still interesting to grown-ups. Oh, we are, we are not talking about the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're not you're not talking about Arthur the little Aardvark from PBS? I, I am not talking about Arthur Aardvark from PBS, no. Okay, um, then what's Arthur Christmas? Uh, it's just a random 
off-brand uh, Christmas movie. Oh, where... it's is it like claymation or something? No, it's CGI. Okay. Uh, the the shtick for this one is that uh, Santa Claus does all the delivery with. He doesn't do it all himself. His army of elves helps him. And so he has this spaceship that's like the size of a small city, and like thousands of elves make airdrops at the simultaneously, and like they're all Just... militarized and hardcore, and they've got the BDUs on with the the berets, and they're yelling at each other like they're military soldiers. Some it, other fantastical explanation for the otherwise incomprehensible fantasy that is Santa Claus. Yes, but like the whole movie revolves around the operations center, and like there's the one of Santa Claus's kids is the COO, and he's just running all the just all the logistics support of who gets what gift, and they're referring to all the kids by their six digit alphanumeric code designations and uh, drop efficiency, and like it's just it's very cool. Yeah. All right, I think I think I'll check that one out. Um, I, my kids may have had it on, and it just didn't pull me in. But apparently, they use the word stabilizer, so I'll, I'll give it another shot. Yeah, everybody in the movie is British, so they use all a lot of the British words. And like when he said it the first time, I was like, I can't even ride a bike without stabilizers. And like, I, what's he talking about? But it comes, it's a Chekhov's gun, and it comes back at the end of the movie. So then, like, oh, he's talking about training wheels. So we had a Christmas gift giving mishap, Josh. Like, how do you have a gift-giving mishap? Did you mislabel okay. it? Well, so there's there's this there's this good tension that exists between me and my wife, between me wanting to go a bit sparse and her wanting to overdo it. And I think between the two of us, we tend to come to a happy medium that works well for everyone involved. Um, but this year, as we laid out all the gifts for all six kids and it kind of done an inventory, she was like, oh, we're looking a bit shy on guy number three. I'm like, yeah, she'll be all right. This is my 16 year old daughter. She'll be okay. <laughs> yeah, she was. When, when okay. are when are 16 year old girls ever okay, Ben? It's hard to shop for. Well, what was the how how big of a disparity was it? Was it a value disparity or was it a quantity disparity? It was. It was like it. It was both. It was both. Oh, um, oh so I mean, you so you bought fewer gifts that were worth less than everybody yes. else's. <laughs> yes, but I thought she just w it wouldn't matter as much as it did. She okay to her credit, we were it was Christmas morning. Everyone was getting their gifts and open them, and and she was there and smiling and happy and open. And as it started to reach the point where it's obvious that there were no more gifts coming, she, you could kind of see the realization slowly coming over. And my wife and I were both watching because we were <laughs> kind of conscious that we may have failed. And Alicia basically let me talk her out of running out on Christmas Eve to buy another gift to get Kaya for Christmas. Oh. We had a couple that could go either way. Like we bought my for we I, I bought an Amazon Echo Dot and we could, we could have gone to her or one of her siblings and I put it in her pile at one point. And my wife just decided to move it over to my my fourteen year old son's pile. Anyway, after all the gifts get open, things equalize a bit, and she kind of takes a, a breath, and then I see her just break down just a little bit. Like she starts to cry for a sec, and then she and we, no one noticed except my wife and I. Really, like no one noticed. My parents were in the room and they did notice um then she pulls herself together wipes her eyes and then just went on with her day and that was all we saw well i mean there's no way to solve that after the fact like you said maybe if you could quickly recategorize a couple of gifts that were already there but leaving to get another gift that's just that's a slap in the face okay. i don't want your pity gifts so alicia had gotten me an atst walker from the mandalorian which Ooh, inexplicably cool. didn't have a baby yoda in it <laughs> inexplicably very upset about Excuse that. Excuse me. Oh, uh, bless you. and I, 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 I walked over to her and tried to give it to her, but she didn't. It, nothing doing. It was too late. Like you said, there was no fixing it at that point. A Sixteen-year-old girl doesn't want an ATST. Ben. No, no, she uh. doesn't. But she'll be a senior next year, and we can get her laptop, and I think it'll average out over the years. She's getting ready to go to college and stuff. Yeah, she doesn't the kids don't look at gift giving that way. They don't look at like, oh well averaging over the last sliding window of four years, I think I'm a little below the average, but they're gonna they, they still have a year or two to make up to like level yeah. out for the decade. My, my kids, wife aired on my side this year and I think she was right. I think I think we kinda of failed a bit. I, kids only remember the year where everybody was opening presents for thirty minutes after they were done. But I don't look at something like this as negative only. Like I also saw her grow up a little bit. Like, as painful as it was to watch her just kind of have her little cry moment on Christmas morning, 
it, it was also kind of it was impressive <laughs> to see her just choke down the tears and smile and be happy for her siblings and move on <laughs> with her life. It's an important developmental stage in every young adult's life to watch Christmas die. <laughs> oh, this so, isn't a magical holiday. This is just another day. <laughs> So last time we we um, teased that uh, you had had an experience that had made you start to think about the um, etiquette of children's birthday parties, and we'd just gone through one of our own. So I think this is a good thing. But you've been looking for a segment, so I don't I don't know. What do you think? Do you think we we could make this a named segment, or are we just talk about birthday parties? So I think we should not about birthday parties specifically, but I do think we should have a named segment because you and I talk about parenting just so freaking much. It makes a nice, clear cutoff point for everybody that comes in and starts listening. Okay, everybody, we're going to talk about how we're terrible at parenting now. And we can just call that <laughs> bad at parenting. All right. And, and frankly, so we should have had the gift-giving mishap under that umbrella. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Okay, bad at parenting, Christmas gifts for six kids. It's a minefield. Uh, <laughs> now, bad at parenting, children's birthday parties. Okay. So, yeah, this was on the notes from last time. We didn't get around to it. Um so part of the holiday just crazy busyness that I had experienced in my life is having to make all of these gifts because I didn't have I just didn't have the hours in, the, in my normal working week to get all of the coasters and everything made. Um, there's another gift that I wanted to make for both my son and my nephew. I did not get those finished. I've only got one of them half finished, and I apologize to him, but he he saw pictures of it and he's fine with it. And then my son he can he can just wait. He got a bike. But then uh, just with the normal work and just the extra parties and then all the extra obligations, I, I, we, we were just slammed. And then there was a day that came around a couple weeks ago where my daughter was invited to two birthday parties for two of her best friends from school on the same day, one in the morning and then one in the afternoon. And then it's like just they deliberately deconflicted. They knew each other. So we found out later that, yes, they did know each other. I don't know if they deliberately deconflicted the times, but it really felt like it. Like somebody had this time first and the other one just kind of moved it. I'm not sure. But okay, so, so, then, so, so far, so far, so good. You know, like, ugh, other than the fact that, you know, there's there. Well, there's our whole day. There goes your day. <laughs> well, we decided that we just had too much going on. and it was Celebrating a little girl turning five. Two little girls turning five. Like it's going <laughs> one to the next one. Like we were just participants. But we can't not go because they're my daughter's friends and she's five and birthday parties are the, are okay. the social event. So five's like the age where you, it's tr you're transitioning from you go and stay for the party because they you kind of need to keep an eye on them to when you could just drop them off. And this is what I wanted to start talking to you about. Like I wasn't – there's no chance I'm dropping them off to this one because the one that we went to was at like one of those third party places, like an actual party place. Like Chuck E. Cheese or something? Kind of like that. It was called Pump It Up. It was on the west side. Okay. Uh, I shouldn't. I guess I shouldn't say the names or whatever. But it was it was a dedicated birthday party place, and you and I knew that as soon as I walked in because they're like, "Oh, which party are you with? I'm with this party." Okay, we're gonna do the training video in about two minutes. Uh, here's your wristbands. Go sit over there with your kids, and then after the safety video, we will transition to the first room. We will be in the first room for an hour. We will transition to the second room. And after the second you room, just we will said transition training to pizza. video for five year olds. <laughs> it was like a safety video with like the generic rules, like no rough housing, be nice to each other, and it was super upbeat. And it had little kids dancing on it. So like it's like a military to... thing before the holiday. Tell you not to drink and drive, so that when you get in a car accident, they can say I told you so. Exactly. Yeah, it, it's a one hundred percent liability thing. Okay, but it was it was. Actually, the whole place was really nice because it was very by the book. Like we were, we went to this first room, and it was also kind of nice because it's you know like a Chuck E. Cheese. You don't know who else is going to be there. This one was the whole party got this room for an hour. There was nobody else that was in there, so it's just the adults that everybody theoretically knew. And I'm doing air quotes, and then all the kids that knew each other, and they had like three or four big inflatable things that you go play on, like the big inflatable slide and a little obstacle course thing, and a couple of. Like midway games with basketball. Okay, hoops or so whatever. pump it up was a play on that. The, the, there's just a whole bunch of big inflatable things there. Yeah, basically, it's just a lot of okay. floor space and inflatables. And then after Got like it. an hour, and like the kids started running down, like they like okay, I've been on everything a bunch of times, and you could see that they're starting to get bored with it. 
And that's right when they came, it's like, all right, we're going to the next room. And it's the same deal. It's just a bunch of inflatables, but they're different inflatables now. And so it's like the excitement level gets ratcheted back up to 11 and the kids go and it, crazy. In instead there. of just having one big room where all the parties get mixed together, they can keep the party separate. Exactly. And then as soon as we left room number one, they can spend 10 seconds sanitizing it and the next party can just flow in right behind us. And the intent is that there are parents there to kind of augment the staff and keeping the kids safe. Yeah, kind of, except, you know, you've been to little kid birthday parties, especially like I walked in, I assessed, okay, this is an enclosed space. She can't leave unless she goes through that door, which is shut. So I'm just going to pull out my phone and just ignore everybody. Right, right, of course. But you didn't leave. <laughs> I did not leave. And yeah, that's what we're talking about is the dropping off versus the staying. Uh -huh. um, this, since this was at like a commercial place, like there was no real option for me to, to leave. So I had to stay, but like, I don't know, I look age? at the host and be like, so what time does this get over? All right. See ya. <laughs> Is there an extra waiver or charge if I just bounce <laughs> out of here? No, that's not. If, but if you're at somebody's house, for example, like uh, if my niece has a birthday party coming up and I just don't want to go, I just don't want to participate. Granted, I'm going to have family and stuff there. This is just for example. Is it okay if she's turning six for me to just drop off my daughter and leave? I feel like I don't know. We've I have been in the conversation at a birthday party, making fun of the parents that dropped off the kids that were then acting terribly. Oh, you'd be a hypocrite then. I mean, I know, but uh, yeah. But at the same time, I wouldn't have to be at the birthday party. Yeah, but why would you mock that? Because now all of a sudden you're like, yeah, I can see why they did that. Like, I want to go. I don't want to stay here for this. <laughs> well, we, we weren't mocking it so much as complaining about, well, yeah, and the people who left are the kids that are being terrible. Oh, okay. Well, wait, how old how old was your nephew when you had the party with the, the darts and the sledgehammers? So he was turning eight. And were all the parents there or is there drop-offs? That's a good question. I think all of the parents were there. I don't know specifically if there are any drop-offs at that one. There was, I have been at a party previous to that. And I, don't, I Don't ask me what the event was. I don't know. But there was drop-offs at that party. And those kids were acting up. And then it just brings into question, like, can we discipline them? Does, <laughs> like, when are the parents coming back? Like, what if we just, like, what if the house burns down and we have to call it quits, you know, two okay. hours early? Well, well, somewhere between the age of five and the age of 10 is the complete cutoff line. And I remember this when I was teaching middle school and we had parent teacher conferences because uh -huh. in sixth grade, like the classroom was packed with parents. In seventh grade, it was like maybe a few. And in eighth grade, maybe one parent showed up. So somewhere between sixth and eighth grade is a cutoff for showing up for parent teacher conferences. Well, somewhere between the age of five and 10 is, is the cutoff for for uh, dropping your kid off at a birthday party. So my daughter, Samantha, just turned 10 on the 15th of December, and she had a little two-hour birthday party. My wife scheduled it at like four in the afternoon so that no one would be confused, that there would not be food served. They just came, uh, did a little craft, played some games, ate cake and ice cream, and sent them all home, and every kid was a drop-off. And there was no question. We didn't say it in the invitation. It was like it was just known that it, for a 10-year-old girl's birthday party, it's a drop-off. Hmm, that makes sense. So... You, there is an age, but it's not defined. Again, like every other stupid parenting rule that yeah, exists in the world. we're just making it up as we go along. Uh, I hate that. Like, there needs to be... Like if the first parent had showed up to drop off their daughter and we kind of... Were they waiting for us to go, so you can sit right over here and we've got something for the adults to do. Were they prepared to stay or, or were they like, oh, I wasn't going to do that? <laughs> Actually, that's a... What you just said is a good idea. Like we make craft stations for the kids and stuff for activities. Maybe we should have like dedicated adult activities at these little kid birthday parties. So you mentioned that in your notes. Oh, and did I? Uh, uh, the third bullet. Oh, phones versus no phones. Yeah. So, and this is this is not so much a birthday party question so much as an etiquette question, because like I said, I went to this birthday party place for my daughter with a bunch of people from her school, and I don't know anybody. Like I did not know anybody. None You're not there to make friends. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to start conversations. I'm going to walk up and introduce myself. Hi, everybody. I know it's first thing Sunday morning and nobody wants to be here, but I'm Josh. Let's have a small talk conversation. No, that's not me. So I, I pulled out my phone and was on my phone basically the entire time. So then my question, but at some, like it did keep recurring. Like, should I be on my phone? Like, am I being 
like actively rude to other people, but I saw enough other parents on their phone the entire time that I felt comfortable with it. It's the portable activity for grown-ups. So maybe maybe if they're coming to state the party as they walk in the door, you hand them a scrap of paper with the Wi-Fi password on it. Yeah, you see, and that's ugh, ugh. all right. So uh, right now, I'm going to make this this uh, public service announcement. If you work in the birthday party industry, if you run any kind of a of a physical retail location, <laughs> <laughs> it not necessarily just that. But, like if you run a a retail location that you that you are expecting people to come and stay for, I'm going to say longer than 15 minutes. You should have free Wi-Fi because yeah, don't not, you no question don't you look at me and tell me oh we don't have Wi-Fi like yeah you do you do have Wi-Fi because Just set this up a is, guest account and give me the password yeah this is this is America okay like everybody has Wi-Fi <laughs> like I, I, yeah there's there's no doubt that you have Wi-Fi you just don't want to give it to me like what are you paying for data on your on your landline internet connection. Okay, so I'm imagining the perfect birthday party invitation. So so far, it tells you whether it tells you whether or not uh, you 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 can drop off the kid, and if you're expected to stay, it gives you the Wi-Fi password. I think the perfect birthday party invitation gives you options. I say the drop off like the party time is going to start at this time. Uh, you need to be in attendance for these specific periods. Otherwise, you can go. There is a Wi-Fi password available, and we will have a soundproof room, or like there will be an outside adult seating area with like a cooler, and we're gonna have the game on. That's kind of telling you that they expect you to stay. Mm, that's true. I don't, you you yeah. can say if you choose to stay, we'll have these things for you, and then it tells you you can go if you want. So this is the discussion that we're having now that that needs to be standardized. Like we need to have some giant gathering of just just pick random people, random adults with kids from around the world, and we're going to sit in a giant coliseum, uh, uh, United Nations style, and we're going to lay out all of these rules. We're going to get them all out at once, all down on paper, and then everybody, there will be no questions asked anymore. It would just turn into the Galactic Senate from Phantom Menace. <laughs> it would never get anything done? Like, no. I, I, ben, I, I know, I get that, but like the running gag is when you have your kids, they don't come with an instruction manual. Well, that's ridiculous. We need to have like a pamphlet or a flyer or something that lays this out. Your kids are going to need shots. Your kids are going to need shots on these just things. magically works. <laughs> There's no magically works. You got to, yes. like everything, you've got to like feel it out. There's no magic about it. Uh, but somehow between the age of five and ten, every parent out there knows that you aren't staying around for a two-hour birthday party for a bunch of ten-year-old girls. But that's not a hard, fast rule. So then what if you have a ten-year-old girl birthday party expecting everybody to be drop-offs and then one of the adults stays? Now you, as Mr. Party Host, have to entertain one other person. So it's not like you can just ignore them or talk to people you like in preference to that person. No, you're stuck. Uh, okay, so like I said, maybe they were, maybe the, I only, me and the other four kids, like once the girls all got there and they were running around screaming, we all looked at each other and we we're like, we're getting out of here. And we went and got in the car and left. <laughs> <laughs> we were gone. We went to the mall. But were parents coming up to the door with looking for signals that they might have to stay, but they didn't want to, or were they coming up to the door and they wanted to stay and were looking for signals showing that it would be okay? I don't know. I, it's, it felt like for the one drop offs I was there for that. It looked like they were new without being told that it was going to be drop off only. I, I just don't know. You, you know what this is? This is just one of a million things where I spend a lot of time worrying about whether or not I'm going to have to talk to other people. <laughs> well, when your daughter turns 10, I think it'll be just as obvious. You'll be like, when did this happen? We didn't get together and hold the Senate session and vote. <laughs> no, and, and, it, uh, and it'll just be undefined. And so there's no certainty any at any point. I'm just going to have to, you know, stick and move. Just keep my head on a swivel. I don't know. So what was the afternoon birthday party like? Uh, so this is my wife and I deconflicted because there was too much stuff to do. And like I, 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 I kind of I very rarely draw hard lines. And this is one of the lines that I drew where I just like looked at it like I, I can't I cannot go to both birthday parties. Like it's just not going to happen. OK, so you took the morning one. She took the afternoon one. Yes. And the afternoon one was apparently terrible. 
because it was at an outdoor park, but it was raining all day. It was cold and rainy and a little windy, and they did not cancel it. They just tried to do everything underneath like one of the little pagodas that they have at those outdoor parks. And like the hostess is a daycare worker. So she knows like all the tricks to hold uh, the attention span of little kids. But it was still from from secondhand reports that I got. It sounded like it was kind of a flop. Okay. So you were it, it was the budget version instead of the commercial, the commercialized curated experience. And you were at the mercy of the elements. Yes. Now, if uh, I had to pick between those two, knowing what happened, I definitely would have picked the one that I went to. Yeah. But they, but they didn't have any Wi-Fi, Ben. <laughs> I think, I, I think we were running low on data at that point, so I couldn't even watch YouTube. Like I was just relegated to like, like reading normal websites. Uh, yeah. Was... Well, well and, and luckily you didn't. Um do it on purpose, like pick the good party and send her to the crap one. So you don't have to, you know, take any accountability right. for that. I also, I can be hold accountable for the weather. So like if it had been sunny and nice outside, the second party probably could have been a lot of fun. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. Oh, here's the other so you thing. Had, about. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, no problem. I mean, we're, well, we're talking about rules for birthday parties. Both of these parties were on Sunday. And I uh -huh. feel like, I feel like that's a no go. I feel like Sunday is no. I mean, Ben, even God rested on Sunday. How yes, am I expected I know, to go to two little kid birthday parties? So Sundays and birthday parties is an interesting thing in my family because having six kids and already one leaving home and the other second graduated from high school, we went all the years that it was a categorical no. Even if it's your best friend in the world, if they hold the birthday party sun on Sunday, you're not going. And recently, about a year, two years ago, Alicia and I kind of looked at each other and, and did something that I'd like to think my parents did from time to time, where we kind of question one of our unquestionable assumptions. Okay. It's like, why do we do that? You know, why, why do we say absolutely no birthday parties on Sunday? Well, there, a lot of that has to do with just what the expectations are for Sabbath day observance for, you know, a devout Christian. Um, but in, to some respect, it's also... Uh, I think the reason we'd questioned our assumption about it was because it's a bit too reclusive. It's like, well, we're not going to associate with you Gentiles that don't observe the Lord's day. So we, we, we questioned our assumptions to take it to a different level. We're like, okay. If, you, the, yeah, if it, you questioned your assumptions based on like, I was like, oh, could this possibly be misinterpreted as rude in any way, shape, or form? Because we yeah. can't have that. Well, it was more like, okay, we're still going to go to church as a family on Sunday, but if they have a birthday party that doesn't conflict with us going to church and it isn't doing one of the other things we generally don't kind of do on Sundays, you know, like go, uh, you know, to business places and, and do financial transactions and stuff that causes other people to work. Uh, you know, if it's just a party at the friend's house and it happens to be on a Sunday, uh, then we won't just categorically say no anymore. We'll, we'll evaluate it. Okay. Because well, we used to just say absolutely not. Well, and I wish I had an absolutely not rule because that makes it just way easier to say no. Because I don't yeah. know. I, I, I want Sunday off. Like I need to yeah, relax. So that was – you spent all day working. So did you buy two presents? Yes. Yes, we did. Oh, actually, we bought one present twice and then wrapped them and then gave them to both people. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> they well, this got is, the same gift. <laughs> I was tasked, like we were at, uh, I think it was the day before we went to Walmart. Again, we were super holiday busy. And my wife and my son went like, all right, we got to get like grocery shopping for pies and cakes and like the dinner. So we're going to go this way. You take Jane and go get two presents for her friends. And like, I thought like, oh, I got the easy job. This is going to be great. And no, I by far had the harder job. And like, because we got to the toy aisle, I was like, oh, look at this. This is great. I want this. And I had to grab her and like turn her shoulders to me, both hands, eye level. Jane, these are not for you. These are for I've your friends. I've given that same talk like six times. <laughs> what like, do I your... love this. I want this. Listen, yes. we're shopping for someone else. Yeah, what do your friends like? It's like, well, they, and like, it just, and she's five, and she's scatterbrained. And so it's 
like pulling teeth, man, trying to get any kind of intel on what I should buy for these little girls. And I'm trying to do a good job, which Wait, was my was your plan A was to get her to help you? <laughs> <laughs> just no, I don't need her help. I just need I need something. Give me give me a starting point sure. and then I'll go from there. I know the budget. I know how big it should be because this will fit into a, a gift bag so I don't have to wrap it. Well, choosing the thing that she was excited about isn't a bad place to go. Here's a question for you, though. <laughs> did the little girl that had the birthday party and how big can Jane's social circle be? Did the little girl that had the birthday party in the morning go to the birthday party in the afternoon and see the same gift? Yes. <laughs> the answer is yes, they did. <laughs> yes. I don't think. That's but this is the thing. This is this is a new thing that I've I've just now seeing that I'm a big fan of, and that is typically the kids don't open the presents at the parties. Like if you're having a big group party, you just get the gifts, like and you say thank you, and that's it. And then the gifts go away, and you open the gifts some I've other time. I've never been to that party yet. Oh, those parties are the best. That because sounds nice no, though. It is nice because it's like oh okay. Everybody stand around in a circle and let's watch this little girl freak out about thing after thing after thing. No, I've got, I'm on the clock. We got these trampolines for two hours. Thank you for the gift. Get back out there and play. It's not just that, though. It's also what you're talking about. I, I can what I think we're going to next, which is what's the budget? Because, you know, when you're doing that, you're sending the grownups that are standing around watching all this the signal like, oh, we didn't spend as much money as the other parents did. <laughs> That's true. Oh, who got you this remote control car? Oh, who got you this pack of stickers? And then you just give them the look. Just, <laughs> really? Stickers. That's what we public, got. Public shaming for the purpose of maintaining this social construct. Yes, exactly. And while so we're talking, what about, do you consider to be your min max budget? Okay, for this birthday parties, the min was twenty bucks. The max was probably for me it was like thirty five. Like any more wow. than that's just ludicrous for a little kid. Okay, so my min max tends to be ten to twenty. Ooh, that's probably better. Yeah, I, I should get, but I don't want to be the guy that's shamed. Like I, I don't know. I, I'm I try okay to, with that. I try to. I always tip like twenty percent or more, regardless of the service. Like I, I don't want to be that guy that's like that's not pulling their weight karmically, if that makes sense. Yeah. So like I'm, I'm not a big. I don't, I don't have any religious beliefs, but karma I feel like weighs over me. Like I can feel that guy tapping on the shoulder, like hey. You only spent fourteen dollars on that birthday gift. Did you see the other stuff that she got? Yes, yes, Karma, I saw it. I'll do my best next time. I'm sorry. <laughs> like if you're gonna be a tightwad somewhere in your life, this isn't the place. Yeah, like five year old little girls. I mean, come on. How how can you? Uh, it's, well, I say that it's easy to justify being cheap. Oh, they're five. They'll 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 love the stickers and they'll forget about the remote control car. But at the same time, they're just so it's just so easy to make them happy, right? Yeah. And it, so, but. I didn't even get to finish. The, the best part of the story was I failed. I failed at my task entirely. This is I'm, Why? I'm back at Walmart. I'm trying to pull intel out of my daughter. I'm trying to pick two things. Okay? And okay. then uh, it took too long. Did you go in, in intending to get two s separate gifts and not the same gift twice? Yes. I intended to go to get two different things. And um, I had one thing in my hand, and I was trying to get intel on the second person. Okay, what does she like? What does she do? What does she talk about? And then sure. that's when that's when my wife and my son pulled up with the full cart, having finished their task already. And she's like, mm -hmm. what are you doing? I'm like, I'm trying to find the present for this person. And she goes, okay, well, the present you have, this we're not getting this. And she puts that back. And she uh -oh. goes, and then she goes, ah, these. Grabs two things, throws them in the cart. We're out of here. Let's go. And so Nicole just solved the problem by, was like, and after she did it, I'm like, okay, that was probably the better way to solve this problem. Just get two things that make sense. Hey, you learned something new. Yeah, that I was overthinking a five-year-old birthday gift. Yeah, well, you went in with some false assumptions and found out the hard way that <laughs> they were. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, if anybody's listening, don't don't plan your little kid birthday on Sunday. That's I don't like that. Like, okay, me personally, it's not going to work. Steer clear Sunday. Give a clear signal that the parents can go. Uh, okay, so we had an interesting thing happen where, where my, my daughter kind of came up to my wife one week before her birthday and was like, I want to have a birthday party. And my wife's like, no, nah, we don't really have enough time to plan it and prepare it and stuff. And she's like, no. Notice. No, you got to have notice. I want to have a birthday party. And, and she's like, well, uh, we're going to do it. And I, 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 I think blanched turned white and ran away i don't know how, how the rest of the conversation went but i came back <laughs> in later and my daughter was handwriting out invitations so apparently my wife was outsourcing the labor on this part of the the birthday party planning and i looked at what she was writing and she was telling them like what presents she wanted and like how to dress and and oh, i was no. like 
oh no oh no no did your mom know you're writing this and she's like yeah i'm writing the birthday i'm and she had like envelopes out and she was getting ready to seal them i'm like you cannot seal these in envelopes until your mom has seen it i'm like alicia get in here you got to see this and she's like oh <laughs> samantha you can't do that all right let's talk about what you get to write and the birthday invitation so she fixed it and we had this interesting talk with a little kid where we we're like well you can't really tell them that you want gifts you just can't really talk about that and she's like why i'm like i don't know you just can't that's a social etiquette thing. These are unwritten rules. Like, I oh, I'm having a birthday party. Bring a gift worth at least $30. Social faux pas. Yeah. Like, you can't do that. So I get anxiety about this because Alicia, for all her virtues, is not an event planner. She doesn't like it. She's you know, doesn't practice, doesn't put a lot of effort into it. And so I thought I thought when she agreed to do this birthday party thing, she was going to take it on, like really take it on. So we had something. Uh, one or two days later, it was like less than a week before the birthday party. And we got in the car together and we were driving. It was just me and her. And I, I thought we were going to talk about something else. And she brings up the birthday party and she starts asking me questions that make me feel like she wants me to either plan it or execute it. <laughs> and those, those probing my questions. Start, my vision started to narrow. Uh, my, I think my <laughs> pupils dilated, and I just like I panicked. I freaking panicked. Like I went, I, I, I got really upset. Like because what what you're talking about, how much advance notice you need to give before you have a birthday party. I w I knew it was well inside of the time for the advance notice, and I didn't want anything to do with it. Like I would, I just wash my hands of it. I'm like, I will make a cake. I will make sure the house is clean. And then I'm not even going to be there. Well, uh, yeah, that's all you can really do. Right. I, but yeah. like, you got to have notice. You can't be within a week. I can't get an yeah. invitation for this weekend. That does not fly. Honestly, I almost right. think two weeks isn't enough. Like you're going to tell me so, I, I go someplace next weekend. So two weeks you think is the minimum. I think two weeks is the minimum. Yeah, definitely. Well, is there a maximum? Like, hey, come to my kid's birthday party in six months. Yeah, that's that's ludicrous. No, I don't know what I'm doing in six months. Get out of here. I think right. the maximum has got to be probably, I want to say a month or six weeks, but six weeks even sounds too long. It's All right, gotta be so a we're month. making a manifesto. I'm going to make an infographic for this episode of Bad at Magic. <laughs> the, okay. the rules of thumb for birthday planning. Yeah. From, from what age you need to be there, from what age you can go, what the birthday present budget is, make sure you give the Wi-Fi password, what day of the week is off limits, how much advance <laughs> notice is enough but too much. Uh, what else? What else do we need on our infographic? Uh, adult social action encouraged or not necessary. All right. Adult play area provided. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's a good one. Do I have to eat the same crummy pizza they get or is there going to be a separate cooler? Um, yeah. yeah. Oh, geez. Okay. Yeah, this is information right. the adults need to evaluate. If, That's right. Like, we're going to make an infographic. It's going to go viral. And we're, we're, we will set the social norms. We don't need a galactic senate for this. We'll <laughs> use the power of the internet. That's right. We will just, uh, what is that, an autocracy? We will dictate from on high. These are now the rules for little kid birthday parties, period, dot, end of discussion. Make sure there's a hashtag, bad at magic at the bottom of that. <laughs> yeah. Glorious. All right. So I think that ends that segment. Um, okay. So I wanted to talk gaming for a minute because I came out here with my family and I have a family. I, I don't know if I would call them gamers in the sense of when you say gamer, you think of like somebody that like wears a headset and plays Fortnite or something. But the, my family loves to just play games. I think they fit in real good in like Germany or something where that's socially normative. Um, but I've got a whole bunch and, and the whole spectrum like it. If it's a real easy, low burden of entry game, like a lot of my family will join in. And then there's the others that kind of are secretly waiting for their chance to bust out the like super complicated six yes. to eight hours worth of investment kind of game. Well, that's me. That's this guy in my family. Everyone's like, oh, you guys so, want to play a game? And they're thinking of like Checkers or Monopoly. And I'm like, oh, I've got this great game right here. Let's play this. It only has a thousand pieces. Yeah, I yeah, it'll be fine. Set, I'll be done with setup in like an hour. Go have dinner and come back. Yeah. <laughs> so my brother-in-law loves this game called Twilight Imperium, and it does. I, I sent you some photos of it, and I'll put them in the show notes. You did, and I think my res my initial response to that was that looked like a game I'd be interested in. Yeah, you would have enjoyed it, uh, and 
yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll get to that one in a minute. But he, so since I've been here, there have been one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There have been ten different games played. Uh, just in the week that I've been here with my family, we played ten different games. Some of we played multiple times, but man, it's been all over the place. So I want to I I categorize them by their I, I forget if we came up with a name for this when we talked about it, like in one of the early episodes. But just the level of how hard it is to understand the rules and, and join in a game and play. Yeah, the level of nerd that you need to be to appreciate and enjoy the game. Yeah. So one we played that I've played, I think, three times and really enjoyed each time is one called Blockus. I don't know if you ever played this. It's it's for a maximum of four players. You just have this grid that's like a, a 40 by 40 grid, and then you have a pile of little colored pieces that look like Tetris pieces. Okay. You could fit the rules for this game inside a fortune cookie. That's always a good sign. Each player takes a turn. You put one of the little pieces on the board, and you the only rule is that your piece has to be diagonal from one of your existing pieces and not adjacent to one of your existing pieces. And mm-hmm. then the rest just happens. Basically, the shapes of the pieces, the size of them makes it so that eventually you start conflicting and overlapping with the other players, and the winner is the one with the least pieces when you can't play anymore. Uh, Everybody passes and nobody can play anything else. Whoever's placed the most pieces. Yeah. Hmm. That one's pretty fun. I enjoyed it a couple of times. Blockus, I recommend that one. Um, My sister gave me for Christmas one called Just One Word. It's one of those that has all the seals on the box that like uh, Spiel des Jahres and Game of the Year and that kind of stuff. It was called Just One Word. And it's like a party game where you're trying to guess like charades along that kind of line. But it was it had some really unique aspects to it that brought out some really interesting uh, aspects of these this category of games. So the way it works is you have a category card and on it is a word that you have to guess and then all the other players are cooperating to try to help you guess that word and the way that it works is uh the the words chosen at random it'll be one word let's say for instance it was elephant and then everyone in secret has to write on their little marker board a one word clue for it and then without Telling the person that's supposed to guess, they have to deconflict, and anyone that wrote duplicate clues is out. Ooh, so they don't. So if they wrote duplicate clues, then those clues don't get revealed. Right. Ooh. So the only clues that get revealed are unique clues, and you can't coordinate. You can just think to yourself. Right. So it's and almost then, like it's a combination of like reverse charades, where it's a group trying to have one person guess, and then also each person's trying to find some really esoteric, weird thing to say. That's one word to describe the other thing. Oh, right. That does sound So fun. you could you could kind of risk it and try the obvious clue and just hope no one else did. Or, right. you know, like, for instance, one round it was um, king. It was king, you know. So you, somebody could say monarch, but if two people said monarch, that's out. Uh, I said burger, uh, which by <laughs> itself is a terrible clue. But when you have a few other esoteric clues... Right. Uh, then, then it all comes together, and you're like, "Of course, Burger King." Well, now hang on. Did you spell? Do you spell burger with an e or a u? Uh, B u r g e r. Ah, oh, when you said that, I immediately thought, "Oh, he wrote burger with an e, like some kind of a like a medieval ruler." Oh, Burger small... Meister, Meister Burger. No, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I <laughs> thought you were going with. No, you went Burger King. You went the obvious, like plan words. Yeah, but the, but. It creates kind of like a Venn diagram, you know. You you you're like, okay, I've got whatever five clues <laughs> here, and I got to okay. get them all inside of one circle. Listeners, we found the reason Ben likes this game is he uh-huh. just equated it to a Venn diagram in his head. That's why he loves just one word. We played like ten rounds of it, and I was I was kind of astonished at how it brought out these interesting moments because I played so many games where you're just giving one word clues and trying to guess and that kind of stuff. But it was really interesting that the the fact that you're trying to come up with obscure clues that other people aren't getting really makes for some interesting moments where it's really exciting when they think of it or when you're a person that knows it and you see all the clues that seems obvious to you, but you look at them and see that it's not obvious to them. Right. And there was one where we had, I think, there was seven people playing, which meant that there was a maximum possible six clues the person could get. And my son was up, and, like, uh, four of the people had duplicate clues, and so he got two clues, and they were terrible clues. And he guessed it anyway, <laughs> and we all cheered. It was so exciting. There was another time where the clue was emperor, 
and I think someone put like um, Supreme, uh, Supreme, and somebody else. Put, uh, I put um, anyway. Everyone canceled out, and the only two people that left to put the clues naked and nude. <laughs> what Supreme was the was or, or Emperor? A- Emperor. Emperor oh, right. was the word. Like the Emperor's and, new and clothes. They were thinking of the Emperor's new clothes, which would have been fine if you'd had a few other clues to contextualize it, but those all canceled out. So then the person, the only two <laughs> clues they got were naked and nude, and they were supposed to get Emperor from that. No chance. And you see, this is, really the, this is the meta thing that happens with games. This is why I like games uh, in general, is when you're playing with a group of people, like completely separated from the game is you have these moments where like the game facilitates and sets up this elaborate scenario where then everybody falls down laughing at the poor teenage kid that the only two clues he got was naked and nude and they're expected to say something that relates to those two clues in front of like their entire family and yeah that has very little to do with the game and more of like the situation was hysterical and the game just facilitated getting there exactly I, I totally agree with you. That's a that's an example of a good game. It, it isn't overly mechanical, but it just facilitates these moments that happen. And there was a lot of them. So I'd recommend this one. Just one word. Uh, the other easy game we played was called Pass the Pigs. It's this game where you have these little dice that look like pigs, and you roll them, and you get points based on how they land, whether they're bouncing <laughs> upside down or on their side or whatever. It's a silly game, but it's, it's just easy to sit down and play without any mental commitment so just one word block us and pass the pigs were my easy games do you have any uh, that you played that fall in the easy category um usually like at a group uh, gathering we have a couple of games that we play um i'll say two of them they're both dice games one is uh, left right center you've ever played that yep okay so you just have like those dice and then the chips yes so i, I imagine that you guys would play with the chips we actually pay with like dollars so we play <laughs> So it's, it's the same concept, but with money. Um, then yeah. also a game called Shut the Box. Have you ever played Shut the Box? No, don't know that one. Shut the Box is an interesting game that my dad got at a garage sale and since then loves it and has got a fancy set for it. It's it's literally, it's in a box and you open it and the idea is you're supposed to shut the box. Um, it's got these 10 counters with the numbers, uh, not 10, more counters, it doesn't matter. It's got the numbers 2 through 12 um, on little counters that you can flip down and you have two dice. You roll the dice, and then you put down the numbers that you rolled. Or you can put down the numbers that add up to the number that you rolled. Okay? Okay. So the idea, then, is to flip all all of the numbers or as many of them down as you can. If you roll a number that you can't, you can't flip down the number, or you can't flip down a combination of numbers that add up to that number, then you're done. And your score is whatever the numbers that are showing from right, you know, from left to right. Like you just read the numbers that are left. And so it's not unheard of to get scores of like 235,789. So what's the tension in the game? Is there like a gambling element where you can try to win but you go too far? So yes, like there's there's different like little tactical things that you're doing while you're playing it. So like say for example, you roll a 7, which is the most common number to be rolled on two dice. Right. So do you flip down the seven or do you flip down the three and the four or do you flip down the two and the five or do you flip down? I see. There's different combinations you can do. And it's like, oh, do you really want to flip down the two? Because the two goes for any even number. And if you then roll snake eyes, you're completely toast. Got it. So there's so yeah. there's a little bit of a understanding the probabilities and playing to that. But also you could just get lucky. And so it, that creates that. Uh, X factor you were talking about that just makes for exciting moments. Exactly. And then uh, again, my family is you know, we're terrible, but we, we ramp up the expectation with uh, drinks. Whoever loses has to usually do a shot or drink whatever drink that they have left and just finish it. And then if you shut the box, which is you get to flip down all of the numbers that is shutting the box, then everybody else has to drink. Okay. Shut the box. And he found it at a garage sale. I've never seen this before. Yeah, my dad found it at a garage sale. And it's a fun little party game. And it's easy to learn, easy to play, and you just pass it around. That's good. Okay. So Those are probably the next, easiest games. Next next tier is the medium uh, tier. And I'm just reading all, just ones I played this week with, with my family. Um, wow. The ones I have listed in this uh, tier are Splendor, Trivial Pursuit, Wavelength, and Exploding Kittens. So Splendor uh, is one of my recent favorite games. I, I love this game uh, because it, it's a it's a com- 
market game. I don't know if you played it. There's a limited pool of resources, and then there's three tiers of production, and you kind of have to negotiate your way up through the tiers until you reach the victory level of achievement of sustained production it sounds kind of boring but it's very interactive you can you kind of see what your opponents are doing um it's really easy to understand like it seems complicated but but just you can walk up and sit down know how to play in five minutes and and be pretty good at it okay have you have you played it i have not Hmm, I'll have to play that one sometime. I recommend that one. Uh, Trivial Pursuit. Everybody knows that game, but my my um, brother-in-law went down to my sister's basement, and he came up holding this Trivial Pursuit, but it was called Trivial Pursuit Bet You Know It. And it was like someone at the, I don't know, Milton Bradley think tank was trying to solve the problem with Trivial Pursuit. Everybody knows how Trivial Pursuit works. You got the pie, and you got the different kinds, and you go around the board, but there's like three main problems. One is... The rest of the people are just sitting around not interacting the whole time. You're just watching someone else answer a question, which is kind of dull. Mm -hmm. uh, two is that, you know, there's the five, the six different categories, and sometimes you have one or two that you're not very good at, and then you just spend the whole time failing to answer those questions, and the ones that you, the category you're not good at, you know, arts and 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 whatever literature or science or whatever. You just there's the one you don't know, and you spend the whole time not getting it. It's pop culture for me. I'm never going to know any of the popular singers or actors. I don't. I just don't know them. So this version of Trivia Pursuit, you'd recognize it in a second. You still got the little round things with the pie pieces in it. But it solved both of those problems. So what you do is you pass out uh, 15 poker chips to all the other players. And when you're not the one answering the question, it has a mechanism for revealing uh, what category they chose you know what um the six different color pie pieces they're trying to get and then also what subject matter the question is about so then knowing the person and the subject matter and the question you you bet up to 10 chips whether they will get it right or wrong oh so it's you're betting on the person answering yes so there's oh. on the board there's two uh two spots that correspond to your color one's right and what's wrong and you can put out up to 10 chips on either side uh, now, right or wrong can the person answering the question see this these chips yes so, so they could deliberately throw the question to screw the people like if everyone bet that they were going to get it right they that's could, what i was getting but, at yeah but then they don't get the pie piece and they're not progressing toward victory so it creates this interesting tension that didn't exist and makes it interactive every single question is interactive with every single player every time and it solves one of the biggest problems of, of trivial pursuit that's true if the chips interact with the game in another significant way so like, here's you... here here's how the chips interact with the game in another significant way Perfect. if you land on one of the roll again places it's not just a roll again place it's roll again or buy a pie piece so Ooh. if you have enough, if you've earned enough chips through good betting, then you land on the roll again place, then you can buy a pie piece in your weak slot. So theoretically, you can win a game of Trivial Pursuit without ever actually having answered a question. Yes. You just got to be good at the betting and, and get up enough chips. And it's a lot. You know, it costs 10 chips to buy a piece. Uh, and then at the end, once your pie piece holder is full and you get your last question then the other people get to choose which category and which subject for you unless you have enough chips and then you get to choose your own oh okay so there's the so when we played last to. night alicia answered every single question right and and skunked us in like seven rounds but it was way fun like i hadn't had that much fun playing trivia pursuit ever and i i think i might get that one oh, very cool that does sound good yeah and it's, it, I'm glad some smart person was sitting around going, you know what the problem with this game is? Is that some people aren't good in some categories and everyone's sitting around not doing anything. So how can we get everyone involved and solve those problems? So this is just in general. Name a thing. Like anything under the sun. There is a person who spends all of their time thinking about studying and trying to optimize that thing. Yeah. Some right. I mentioned the other ones. Uh, I, Splendor and Trivial Pursuit bet you know what I mentioned, but Wavelength and Exploding Kittens, I don't want to talk about those. Exploding Kittens, don't don't try that one. It sounds cute and oh, fun, but it's not. I was going to ask you about Exploding Kittens because I think I've seen it. Um, is that the yeah. artist that does Cyanide and Happiness? Like made the Yeah, yeah. It, it's it's cutesy, but it, it it's not fun. Just play Magic. It's, it's like a combat. It. Yeah, it's like a combat game with like kittens murdering each other or something, right? 
Yeah, yeah. There, there's a deck, and in it is a card that says Exploding Kitten, and there's ways to interact with the deck so you don't get it, and you don't want to get it, but it, it's not fun. I, I don't like it. <laughs> and I don't like the I don't like the the art, and I don't like the idea. It's supposed to just be kind of tongue in cheek, cutesy. No, no, don't play that game. Okay, fair enough. So, um, it, go ahead. What do you got any in the medium category? Sure. So, um, one of the things these are going to be video games. Like, I'm not going to talk at length about these at all. But uh, during the holidays, I've been playing a game called Hollow Knight. That's on the Nintendo Switch, and yeah, I think my son plays party. that. Yeah, Hollow Side Knight is scroller, great. old school graphics looking. Yes, so it, it honestly it looks beautiful. The art's very well done. It looks like you're playing a cartoon, and it's a it's a Metroidvania for those of us that are hardcore video game nerds. And the idea there being that there is a large map that you at first you can't you can go most places, but you can't explore the whole thing. There's sections of it that you're be inaccessible until you unlock other abilities. And so you'll figure out eventually the ways and the places you're supposed to go to get the abilities to unlock other places that you can go to get other abilities. And so you're constantly crisscrossing back and forth across the same areas with different ways of interacting with them. So, and it, it looks really good. It's worth the money. It's a really good game. Uh, my son Why likes the Why would you not just play Metroid or Castlevania? Like, what about this game? What's its selling point to me if you're trying to get me to play this and so just go back on the classics? Uh, so the classics... This is the thing, like, yeah, we, we compare everything to the classics. We call this a Metroidvania game because those were the first ones that did it. But this is the thing, the first people that do stuff typically don't do it very well. Like, Metroid and Castlevania, they're good, but they're also, like, punishingly hard. And there's no good save mechanism. There's no, like, if they're, they're hard. This, this one has, like, it shaves all the rough edges off of it. So the game is still okay. is still difficult, but then it doesn't punish you as bad for losing. Like you can get back into it very quickly. There is some minor setbacks, but and then also the story is a lot better. The art is way better than it used to be back in the day. I'd recommend I, it. I've only heard like the music, and it's it's that tinny sounding like single MIDI channel music. I don't like it. Okay, well, I would encourage you to. Like watch your son play it for twenty minutes or so before you start yeah. judging it based on the soundtrack half for it as you're passing through the room. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, it's it, if you like those kinds of games, this is one that without all the bad parts, I can I can handle that. That's, that was good sell. Okay, uh, the other one, my son got um, the new le or the remastered Legend of Zelda game for the Switch, uh, Link's Awakening. Yeah. And so I think that was an old Game Boy classic, I think. Like, yeah, I, don't know. I got it for Jairus, and he beat it in like 24 hours. Yeah, and that's the problem with the remastered Game Boy games, is the Game Boy yeah. was a very small system. But like my wife got it for him, and I figured, uh, she asked, like, oh, is this a game that he should get? I'm like, actually, that'd probably be pretty good, because it's much smaller scale. The fact that it came from the Game Boy, there's probably not going to be a ton of reading that he has to do. Like, he can mm -hmm. read, but he's eight, so he's hesitant to do it. Like, he sees a wall of text and just starts clicking the button. Like, well, you don't even know what to do now, but that's fine. But the so graph, what's the verdict? Does he like it? Uh, he's played it a handful of times. Um, jury's still out on really. whether or not he's going to dedicate to it. I still think this style of game is not... I don't think he has the attention span for it. He doesn't get yeah. vested enough into it. He's yeah. still... Well, my 17-year-old loves it. Yeah, I, I felt bad. Like, after he played it, I was like, did you... Uh, do you feel disappointed that you finished it the day after Christmas? He's like, no, nah, I'm playing it again now on the harder level and trying to get everything. Okay. Well, and that's the like if you're if you truly appreciate the medium, that's what you do. It's like, oh, I'm just going to crank up the difficulty, or I'm going to put some arbitrary like, uh, uh, yeah, people. You look at the speedrunners; they do all the random. They'll just come up with random rules. Yeah. Like, okay, now it's not just about beating as fast as possible. Who can beat it as fast as possible with only three hearts or something like that? So the question is: Is Carter going to reach the level where he's interested in that kind of game? before something new comes out that, that captures his <laughs> attention and it just ends up gathering dust in a corner. So I think he's just too young yet. I think he's just eight. Like he doesn't have the long attention span to get really invested into something like that. Yeah. So uh, as he gets older, I I, just, I presume that he will. I, he's my son, so I mean, I did. If he if he turns he into did. one of those like uh, Call of Duty or like Halo players, I'm going to be sad and disappointed. But like you can't control that. That's just who they are, Ben. So, you have to accept them for that. So you introduce him to Pokemon over Christmas. Is that in the medium category? <laughs> um, like, I didn't want to insult 
the the entire Pokemon trading card game by calling it medium instead of hard. But yeah, it's uh-huh. it's it's definitely medium. <laughs> yeah. So and yeah, uh, he mentioned that one of his friends in schools collects Pokemon cards and brings them in and shows them sometimes. And so Santa Claus, being the uh, attentive person that she is, got him uh, one of the starter packs where it comes with two really super dumbed down basic decks and like all the instructions you need to start playing. Okay. And so then uh, me and Carter got to sit down and learn a new trading card game together. And it was very, very fun because I got to sit and play like a, a paper card game with my son. And it was very, very frustrating in that like there are so many just innate built-in rules in my head for how to optimize your strategy and win a card game like this, like a resource management card game like Magic the Gathering, that I was constantly fighting with my own inner spike, trying not to just decimate my poor son because I want him to enjoy it. Because <laughs> you have all these skills that are transferable from other things you've done. You're well, like, because, okay, this is the first time playing this, but I can see where this is all going and I could destroy you. Yeah, well, it's just like he, he he's, it's his turn. He's got five cards. And he's like, oh, I'm going to play this card. And it's shuffle your hand into your library and draw six cards. And like, I'm trying so hard to, to tell him, like, you don't want to play that right now. You want to play Wait out until you use the other four cards. That's in your right. Hand. Play out everything in your hand, so you don't have to shuffle anything back. He's like, but I don't like these cards. Like, it doesn't matter. You have to use them. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, but you got to maximize your resources. Yeah, exactly. Have you learned this yet? Yeah, it's yeah. That's the thing. And so, it's the probably the most advanced card game that he's ever played. But it's not very hard. The mechanics yeah. are very basic. The resource management is fairly straightforward, very transparent. And what's interesting about it is I was like, oh, I wonder how deep this game goes. And so, like, the next day I was on the internet doing quick searches. Like, and they do have, like, I don't know if they have a pro tour, but they do have, like, world championship matches and games. Oh, they absolutely do. I I have photos of me at the uh, regional championships. Well, there you go. But then I started looking at, like, the deck lists and the cards that they play and then reading some of the more advanced rules and realized that, yeah, uh, I'm not going to go into details, but basically the design space in this game is so small that there's only a couple of avenues that they have to make new cards desirable to be purchased, which then alters the way that you play the game. Like, why on earth would I ever play this basic Pokemon in my deck when I can play this one that is clearly quantifiably better and there's zero downside? Right. So they, yeah, and that's, that's how the whole, that's from what I can tell, that's the the way the entire game is built is just the power level just keeps creeping up. And I don't, they, they look like they're getting close to like the, the, the ceiling of what they can even make in this game. Hmm. I, I have a friend that um, crossed over from playing competitive magic to playing competitive Pokemon. Uh, and the regionals are like uh, just a uh, 10 miles from my house. And he drives out from Colorado Springs to go and last year he stayed with us when he went there and his daughter uh got made like top four for her age bracket wow um and qualified for nationals so i don't know how she did in nationals but i assume they'll probably come out again next year when it's time so we went and watched him play for a while the, and, and yeah it's like you said there's all the restrictions and and the kids play at the levels they are and the ones that can maximize their resources the best and get it a little bit lucky do well and i think she had a bit of both that weekend um so in my hard category i only had one game uh trogdor the board game i don't know if you're familiar with homestarrunner.com the uh flash cartoon website by matt and mike chapman ben i went to college in the early 2000s you can bet bet your butt that i know everything about homestar runner so you know that in that universe they've branched out into other things you know they make little like 8-bit video games and stuff like that well they made a game that was like a mock-up of King's Quest where you're on a quest to defeat the dragon Trogdor, mm-hmm. and, which is an inside joke from one of their other sketches. Well, they actually produced a full-scale board game like, you know, um, Kickstarter style where and my brother got it and brought it and, and put it out. And I wanted to like it, which kind of hints at what my opinion <laughs> on it was. But the instruction book was so thick, and he just read it and read it and read it. And as, as the instructor just kept going on and on and on, my brain started to shut down. Now, it is one of those games that if you're familiar with the character and the universe, that you can kind of just grok it, which is why I don't like just reading the rule books. You know, okay, we're a team. It, it's, a, it's a players versus game game. You know, right. like uh, 
where all the players cooperate to try to defeat the mechanic that, of the game itself. Right, and then the the game has a set of rules that it follows, and so you have this list of instructions that you execute at the end of each turn that the game does. Yeah. Yes. So if you like the lore of the idea of, you know, a, a big green dragon with one beefy arm that runs around burninating the countryside and you want to do that, <laughs> great. I think it would be easier the second time, but ultimately it just felt like not a fun game to me. I, I just didn't like it. Overly complicated. There's knights and, and archers running around trying to get you. And so you got to try to burninate the whole countryside and all the peasants before, you know, you get defeated by the knights. And so, like, in my hard category, this actually feeds very well into what I was going to talk about next, and that is um, we played a board game called Carthage. And uh -huh. it, I, I, this is a rule that I know in my head, and I tried to execute, and I did, I did it poorly, and I was called out on it. The idea is that if you're going to, if you want to play a new game with people, and they have had no experience with the game, and you want them to actually sit down and play it with you, you need to know the rules inside and out before you sit down at the table. Because like you said, you sat down and he started reading the instructions and you were out. That's it. I'm done. My attention span is over. No, you don't want somebody to read a rule book to you. You want somebody to explain it to you like a person. Because if, right. the, rule, if the rule book is 40 pages long, we can boil that down to 10 minutes of talking. Right. And, and I'm okay if we have to get the rule book out at some point to solve some kind of dispute. But otherwise, let's just get, let's start playing. Yes. And that's, yeah. So the board game I had was Carthage, and you and I, I think we played that in Texas a couple years back. Absolutely. It's a, it's like a, an arena combat game as if you were a gladiator, a slave gladiator. But you execute everything through uh, a card a deck building game. So you have cards, yeah. and the cards dictate what you get to do. And, and It's a good mashup of two genres, I think. Yeah, it was. It is. I think that's an excellent way to put it. It's a good mashup of... Like, there's fast-paced combat and action, but at the same time, you have to think strategically about the cards that you have and what you're going to play and how you're going to order them. Yeah, and it, it makes you feel like you have an identity. You know, like there's this rock, paper, scissors kind of thing going on in arena combat where you're not necessarily going to win just because you're the most powerful. Yes, and uh, my... So I thought I had known the rules. Like, I, I glanced through the rule book fairly quickly. But then there was all the fringe cases that came up while we were playing, so I had to go back and re-reference, and I kept getting called out like, do you even know what this game does? Like, are you doing everything right? So that was that was funny. But no, everybody, so, we had five-player game of Carthage on uh, yesterday, and everybody at the beginning, like, they were wishy-washy, and like, I don't know, this looks more complicated, I didn't sign up for this, but by the end, everybody knew what they were doing, the rules are fairly straightforward, and it was obvious what the objective was, and... My was it my sister in law won? Really? Yeah, she got the character that has the most in, inherent movement and just stayed out of the fighting. Where the rest of us went into a big mosh pit and killed each other off, and then she came in with full uh, health and she won the Mexican standoff. She, well, she let like some civil war happen and then just came and mopped up the remnants. Um. So what what's the verdict? Did, was it well received among other people? How, how now that you have it, it was well received. Um, this is not something that like there's never. I'm always the driving force behind board games. Like if we're at a family gathering, I'm the one that's like, hey, we should play a board game, and here's three good options for you. But everyone else just kind of wants to hang out and talk, which is fine. And uh, this, this I think will make the rotation. So I might get to play it once or twice a year. Probably. Okay. If you if I was over and you got it out, I'd be like, yeah, I'm in. Let's play. Because I, I had a decently fun time with it the first time, and I'd be willing to play it again. Yeah, very cool. And this is, it's one of those games that's good to have in your closet. It is uh, quick to pick up. So hard isn't the isn't the peak category, though. My I, I, ha I created a fourth category. I'm calling this one insane. And, I, and this is the one I sent you some photos of. It's called Twilight Imperium. Yes, and, and it looks great. It, okay, inside the box, not only is there a 40-page instruction book, there's a 40-page lore book that's, like, telling you the backstory. Uh, <laughs> I'm in. I'm so in already. Like, that just feels like a warm, fuzzy blanket. Like, here's why you're yeah. doing this. Okay, so it, 
mechanically it's it's a hex board a hex um board game where you know you set it up kind of at random so that the board has a bit of deviation from time to time so it always it doesn't just feel like playing on the same board and then you have a uh, civilization i forget how many there are to choose from my my viewers that play this game or, or listeners that play this game are probably shouting but it's it, it's got to be like 15 or something different civilizations you could be that all have different attributes that make them either better at flying through space or colonizing planets or those kinds of things Excellent. and the backstory is that there's this planet that used to rule the galaxy but then something happened and it became extinct and now there's this vacuum of power and everyone has to vie to do it and you can do it through like peaceful diplomatic means or you can do it through force or you can do it through like rapid colonization and everyone has their own strengths and weaknesses and it's very interactive um it's very complicated my, my son jaris made a great joke though he's like hey do you want to play this game it only takes about 10 turns and all you got to do is get 10 points and you win <laughs> and really that's a way over oversimplified synopsis of it but the turns take forever because you know however many players are every player is doing their development and movement and combat and you have you have strategies that you develop and and it has it has a lot of good elements from a lot of fun games i played all combined together in a very good way okay. and if and we were talking about this afterwards about the magic player archetypes if you're a spike and you just want to win there's something for you if you're a johnny combo player and you want to do something creative and interesting the game's got something for you if you're a timmy power gamer and you just want to make big things and do awesome stuff there's something for you if you're a vorthos and you like lore and stories and and, <laughs> and stuff there's something for you and if you're a dave and you just want to piss everybody off there's something for you that it's, sounds fun too if you're willing to make the you know it, it took us six hours to do a game uh if you're willing to make that kind of commitment it 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 was a good time i i really enjoyed that game and i'm glad my brother-in-law did all the overhead to get us playing the question i have for you is how long are the turn lengths like is it just one person doing something for a very long time and then goes to the next person or are they fast turn like is it like i do something for 10 seconds and you do something for 10 seconds and it just takes a while so you brought this up before, and now that you're asking it, I realized that it is like you just said. It's kind of rapid, uh, where you do you do a short action and then you go to the next person. So you're not just sitting there watch one person play for a long time. That is a critical aspect for any board game. Like people will get tired and frustrated and won't want to play it anymore if they have to watch somebody else play a game for a while. I think this is my brother-in-law's favorite game and he loves all kinds of games. He has a huge collection, uh, and, but he really had to corral us to get this to happen. So when we got there to where we were playing in the morning, he already had it all set up. I mean, like all the pieces laid out and stuff like that. And he was giving me the tutorial. It's a kind where you have like a reference sheet in front of you that shows you like what the turn order is and what things you do. So once you have all your stuff in front of you, you can kind of feel comfortable, even though you're new. You're like, okay, I think I know what I do need to do to play this game. Right. So Twilight Imperium, two thumbs up. Good game, but it's definitely in the like insanely complicated category. So you got to have committed gamers. And like my mother wouldn't touch that game with a 10 foot pole. You know, most of my family that we played all those other games with wouldn't come anywhere near. But we had five guys that played together, and it was a good time. Sounds great. Now, while we're talking about the games that we played over the holidays, we would be absolutely remiss if we didn't talk about the king of games. The top, the pinnacle, the the summit of Olympus of, of gaming, which is Magic the Gathering. Okay. You are so right. And I was thinking about what you said earlier about how um, Hollow Knight was a good example of some old games that you liked, but with all the rough edges and corners taken off. And during the holidays, Magic the Gathering Online makes available what they call the Vintage Cube. And this is, I think, a really good example of that. It's like all the best parts of Magic the Gathering with all the rough corners taken off so that it's just pure best of Magic. And you know what? I... I tend to shy away from Magic Gathering online. Like, I have an article on the, our website, badamagic.live. Go read it if you're if you're curious. But Magic is played in three different forms right now. There's Paper Magic, where you go buy the cards and sit at a table and play with somebody, which is still my preferred method. There is the newest client, which is Magic Arena, which is big and flashy and free to play, and it, it adheres to all of the things that video games and online games for are doing nowadays. 
and that is their flagship thing that they're trying to push. And then there is uh, Magic Gathering Online, which has been around since the early 2000s, and it feels like it. It's clunky. It has a terrible interface. It uh, It's not intuitive at all. It's very frustrating. Like, if you make a mistake, like, you're just absolutely punished for it. But at the same time, so, like, I don't like playing Magic Gathering Online. Like, I, I will, and I know how, but I don't like to do it. But I have been playing the Vintage Cube with you because this this format doesn't exist anywhere else. And like you said, this is like a great pure distilled version of a very specific archetype that is just hilarious and awesome and fun to play. Yeah, they only make it available during the holidays. Uh, you know, it, I think it, it would get oversaturated if they let people play it too much. So it's only available for like they, they make it for like the whole month of December and then it disappears for a while and it comes back in April and then it comes back, I don't know, in August or whatever. But whenever it's around, I, I probably do. Oh, man, I must do like three dozen drafts. I just squeeze them in whenever I can. And it's so much fun. I love it. Is uh, Alicia aware that each of these drafts cost $10? They don't. I, I, I haven't paid. I, I think I pay. I, I think I paid once. Uh, right. If you win, you accumulate enough prizes that you can just play again for free. Yeah. Right. So, so the, the I, trick there is to win. <laughs> so this is. So I usually go either two and one or three and zero, oh, and so I either accumulate even number of prizes or more than I started with. Right, and this has been really actually super fun between the two of us because we've been had the opportunity a couple of times during the holidays to sit down and get on Skype. And then we'll both draft, like one of us will draft and like help the other person pick cards and make the deck. And then we'll switch and the other person will go. And I, I have to say, that's been some of the most fun I've had in a long time. Yeah, it's a good time. So highly recommended, two thumbs up. That's all my uh, games I had. Did you want to add any others? Ben, I will talk about games just forever. <laughs> but um, well, This is a podcast about games, life, and other things. <laughs> well, we talked about birthday parties, so that's that's the other things we've talked about games so i guess we have to talk about life yeah okay so i think i'm gonna i think i'm gonna skip bad at english this week i had what one term ready but i don't want i'm gonna wait i'm gonna wait till next week so no Ooh. bad english for the first time ever uh the, fir the first i, I time want ever. to tell you a, game, a story about life so okay did you did you go back and listen to episode nine again I did. I, I tend okay, to... Okay, so episode nine is when I told the story of the Italian job, which you named, and I love that name for it. <laughs> that, that was I introduced you to a, I introduced you to a friend of mine, uh, Andre, the, the auto mechanic uh, in, from Monte Chiari, Italy, who uh, is spoke enough English that he had a, a racket, you know, a um, monopoly on the American broken car market. How can I forget Andre, the man who... Uh, I can only presume found the person who stole the brakes out of Bo's apartment and then offed them or made them disappear. <laughs> the the man who knew all of the the like the sketchy Italian car owners that were going to buy all the illegal you parts from Bo. That's like, a yeah. Guy. This uh, this, uh, this this sounds like a great like extra for our podcast here. This this Andre so, person. After I met Andrea, I started to realize that he was he was uh, like the. 30 something fun single guy that liked to do all the things I like to do. Uh, and I, like he had um, like ski equipment and stuff like that. So I started to kind of probe and, and he was building a, a climbing wall inside his two story auto garage. Uh, so I, I start to ask him about these things and he, I'd be like, Andrea, what's going on over there? So like, Oh, I'm building a climbing wall. Um, it, it will be ready next week. Would you like to come? And I'm like, okay. So I started going every Friday night, I'd go climb Andrea's climbing wall with him. And then we go out for pizza. It was awesome. So I found out that he, he worked in his auto garage year round so that he could take the entire month of like December and January off and go live in an apartment in the Alps and ski nonstop. Wow. And I thought, okay, Andrea is my in here. I, it, I'm like, okay, Andrea, I, I want to take some leave and I want to go do like two or three days of skiing up in the Alps. And he's like, oh, you can stay in my apartment. It would be so much fun. You know, oh, come on, my friend, come with me. And, and he was like way excited. So I, I was like, this is great. I'm gonna go skiing in the Alps with Andrea. Well, it, it, whoa, 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 whoa. Hang on. There is a lot of information that you're imparting very, very quickly. And like, you're giving me absolutely no opportunity to like flag all, right, all, all right, of go the... ahead. Slow me down. Back me up. If you all need right. To. So, so, so first of all, like, Oh, hey, honey, like, uh, I'm not coming to dinner tonight. Go ahead and feed the kids. <laughs> I'm going to spend Friday night with this auto mechanic alone in his garage on his climbing wall. 
Like, that just sounds nine kinds of suspicious and weird. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how to say it. You know, when we were in Italy, we did a lot of weird things. You, you know, we, you, you can uh, have your collar up on a polo shirt, not look like a douchebag. You can go to a pool wearing a Speedo. It's just like when in Rome, you just do as oh, the Romans. Oh, Ben, did you, did, did you switch to Speedos full time when you were in Italy? I did, uh, <laughs> and I didn't even feel weird about it. And then you, once I left, no, I never wore it again. You should feel weird about it. You should feel weird about it, even now. Like, re- <laughs> in, like retroactively, you should feel weird about wearing the speedo all the time. Not like I, I get the when in Alicia. when in Rome. There's there's when in Rome do as the Romans, and then there's when in Rome I still don't want to show my junk. So like, there's lines here that we're crossing. I. I, I I wasn't new to Speedos. I was on the diving team in high school. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, cool. I can do this again. Oh, thank thank you. I finally have the opportunity to wear Speedos again. Ah, oh, God bless Italy. Okay, so... Have you sorry. ever worn one? <laughs> it went... Uh, so, okay, uh, so, so Alicia had met Andrea. She knew him, and it was just... I don't know. It was just like... I, I haven't done something like that before or since, but when I was in Italy and I was stressed out and I just needed... To, we, and I wasn't the only one that went with him. There was like two or three other guys and we'd oh, okay. all go to the garage and climb the climbing wall and, and then go out for pizza. That makes it sound a lot less weird that there's more people. Like, especially then, like, the follow-up is the... Oh, so you know the guy that I've been spending every Friday night with, alone in his garage with the climbing wall? We're actually going to go for a buddy's weekend, like a couple of days skiing in the Alps. Skiing in, in the Alps. In a remote area in his apartment. Don't worry about any of it. It's going to be fun. We're going to have a blast. Promise you that I'm not, like, romantically involved with some random Italian guy. <laughs> okay. So all of that was to lead up to the story. So here's the story. So I, <laughs> I met, I went to meet Andrea skiing in the Alps. I got there like late on a, on a Thursday after work or something like that. Found his apartment up, up near the town in the Alps. And, um, he's like, great. You know, here's, here's where you can sleep. It was just like a little cot I crashed on and we got up super early in the morning. He's like, okay, we're going to go to the hill. Uh, we, we need to get there early so that we can, uh, get out while the snow is fresh and enjoy the slopes. I was like, fantastic. Exactly why I came up here. So we got in the car and we drove out to the lift that was near his apartment. And it wasn't the main lift, but it was one of the like back lifts that serves, you know, parts of the, so you can go up over the back of the mountain and get to the main area. And we pulled up to the parking lot and the parking lot was, um, completely empty and it was plowed and covered in fresh snow. And he looks at the parking lot and he turns to me and he says, you see this? I must do donuts. (laughs) And so, <laughs> which is exactly what I was hoping he would say. Did, did so he, he say, goes did, into the did he, say, he said, must, I must do donuts. I, I must do donuts. This is a requirement. It's mandatory. <laughs> That's what he said to me. I must do donuts. It's mandatory. And me and the two other guys in the car were like, whatever, man, do donuts. Awesome. So we're in the donut, we're in the parking lot and he's handbrake turning and spinning around, making big circles and donuts. And we're like, forgot all about the, the chairlift for a minute. And we do one really good donut and do like three spins around and we come to a stop facing the the entrance to the parking lot and there's a carabinieri car sitting there italian police i knew it that's the only way this can end and we're all staring out the window at this um italian police car with the lights on top you know it's like a fiat or whatever and and um we're all kind of holding our breath and it start and then it it slowly starts coming towards us in the parking lot and then it starts to pick up speed and then it hits the handbrake and starts doing donuts. <laughs> and he turns to me and he goes, you see, it's mandatory. <laughs> well, cops do love donuts. Oh, man. So, and, and nothing happened. Carabinieri didn't do anything. They were like, they, um, they saw the same thing we did in that parking lot. Yeah, I mean, that's, that, that, uh, that's like a screenplay. Like, but that's such a stereotypical thing that had happened. Like, and honestly, it happened to me in real life, Andre, in the Italian Alps. Andre said we ha- we must do donuts, and then the cops like saw you doing donuts, and they saw you stop perfectly and see them. Is like, is there any way we cannot just go do a donut now? Like, this is the <laughs> only way this ends. Cops love donuts. <laughs> that's a good conclusion to that story. <laughs> that is that is a good story about em- just embracing life. Like that's one thing I've always liked about you, Ben. Is you just grab life by the by the horns and just make it, just milk it for everything it's got. All right, I'll tell you. I'll tell you about the time I was a, uh, a dishwasher in a um, British pub. 
some other time. How? What, uh, <laughs> every like there, there is. Uh, you're not even. You're not an onion. You're not an everlasting gobstopper. I don't know what it is. Like it just. The, it just keeps going deeper. Like there is no bottom to this rabbit hole. That is the random life experiences that Ben Rich has had. Like I. I, I feel like. I feel like I have a pretty varied and like weird backstory. Like, I, you know, different from other people, but at the same time, like, there's no comparison. There is, like, the, the, well, the two-book series that is my life, and then there is the encyclopedia set that is Ben Rich's first 30 years. See, I don't think that. I, I'm just seven years older than you. But I, I do have one for you because I'm hoping I can get you to do maybe a segment on this show where you let me do an interview about your time at the United States Air Force Academy. I know we've talked about it in bits and pieces, but I want you to do it like it's a whole, like it's a memoir. Like what happened, Oof. how you decided to go, what you did while you were there, and and you know your kind of conclusions having done the whole experience. So I'm I'm absolutely willing to do that. I'm just I'm now concerned that you think it's going to be way more interesting than it probably will be. Like I don't know. Like well, you talk so about like I'm requesting what, this for what made you sit down and want to decide to go to the academy? Well, Ben. I sat down with my family and I thought for a long time about how free it was. <laughs> okay. okay, good. Yeah, so that's a good start. Uh, <laughs> this will be our teaser for episode 11 because I want, I want you to, you know, maybe come up with an outline or something. Think of a few, you know, anecdotes that you can lead me into and I'll have some questions for you. Okay. Yeah, we can do the, uh, oh, the Academy. Like, that's... Now, like, like this is one of those things, like, if your son comes to you and is like, oh, I want to go to the college that you went to, you would just high-five and be like, absolutely, I'll help you out every step of the way. Like, if my son ever goes, Dad, I want to go to the academy, I'm going to get on a knee, I'm going to look him in the eye, and be like, you need to think real hard about this. Like, let me tell you a couple of horror <laughs> stories, and like, just so you're aware. You need to know what you're asking yeah. for. All right. Well, that's a good that's a good teaser. So I, I want I want to explore that topic next time, and and I can save my story about me versus bureaucracy for next time. There's always a new one going on, but there was one this last week where I got a hundred and eleven dollars bill from the Illinois Tollway uh, last week. So this is another thing that we don't have in Arizona that I'm always curious about how it works, enforcement, and just like logistics, like because toll roads make no sense to me. We were we we went on a vacation to Florida a few months back, and oh, come on, it makes a lot of sense. It's a road; it costs money. You pay to drive on the road, but, all, but not all roads, just some roads, and only if you're going this <laughs> way. <laughs> okay, you can also go on this other sense. road to get to where you're going. It's just a little bit longer, a little bit slower. Like we were at the rental car place, and he says, um, "Oh, do you want the the toll pass?" And we're like, "What's that?" For the toll roads. You have toll roads? Yes. We want the pass because we have no idea how those work and we just want to drive where we're going. Right. You you chose wisely. I did. I chose very wisely because after we were driving around, we realized we went through like six different toll things. No idea. No clue. On ramps. There was random All right, on ramps. So next all right. Yeah, sorry. So next time we'll we'll talk about the exciting world of tolls, and I'll ask you some questions about the Air Force Academy. Now, when I went back and listened to uh, episode nine about the Italian job, and my family had all listened to it, they all came to me and said that was a great episode of Bad at Magic. So if you're just new to the podcast, you're listening to episode nine. Excuse me, you're listening to episode ten. Go back and listen to episode nine. Uh, you said you would have <laughs> some questions for me from it. I uh, did. Yeah, I do like so many little things, so many little questions. Like just, but it's just about picking apart like the things that I missed at the time, or I was focused on something else. Just the whole thing just is is mind blowing. There's just so much to unpack there. But uh, do we have time to do any of that today, or is that something we're no, just going to keep? No, I think her? we're kind of at the end here, so yeah. we, we might have to save that as well. All right, follow which means it'll get separated by more than one episode. There's another follow up that we need to do, unfortunately, because we talked about in the last episode that we should both go see Star Wars and then we should talk about Star Wars because right. we're such Star Wars haters of all the new shit. We've already planned out the whole next episode. Yeah, that's we. I think we've, we're working on the next two episodes. I think. <laughs> I've I've seen I've seen the rise of Skywalker twice, and you've seen it zero times, and that doesn't work. You, know, uh, you can't have uh, nine pregnant women and get a baby in a month. That's true. Yeah, it, it's just not going to work, no matter how how hard the project manager says it should. Um, both of us <laughs> need to see it separately. Uh, I have not seen Rise so, of Skywalker again. The holiday busyness, like it just it just was not in the cards, Ben. I do want to see yeah. it, and I will try to make time to see it. But I, okay, I got another. Give well, me give me another two weeks. 
then don't look at my show notes for episode uh, 11 yet because I put some of my thoughts in it. No, no big spoilers, but definitely just uh, steer clear. Yeah, I, I want to have I want to go into the Rise of Skywalker like just clean, like unbiased, uh, except for you know all the bias that I'm bringing in from. My Not knowing person. anything other than that Skywalker Rises. I think I've seen one preview, and I've been avoiding all oh, of wow. the other stuff. Yeah. I- I'm trying to go in clean, so we'll see how it works. Okay. All right. Well, thanks to our listeners. Thanks for being here. Thanks for listening to us. If you've listened to all 10 episodes, awesome. Uh, <laughs> hopefully, we'll hear you 10 more from now. Um, if you like the podcast, share with your friends. Uh, give us a like on your favorite podcast player app, iTunes, if you got it. Join us on Facebook if you want to join in the discussion. If you're my wife and you want to set the record straight, uh, you can go to our subreddit or uh, our Facebook page or join. go to the website, see Josh's additional thoughts. Um, yeah, glad, glad you're here. Glad to have you. Yeah, we love our listeners. Um, we will interact with them as much as possible. Comments, likes, shares, all of the different social media, whatever the key buzzwords are. I'm not sure. But any feedback you guys get from us, we are more than happy to discuss. Super fun.